Well, we got a wonderful show today, and it's a little twist from what we normally do. We're doing cover crops, but pollinator friendly cover crops. I think you'll find this interesting because I actually learned a lot I didn't know, also. Welcome to the Road by Road Gardening Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the internet where we talk about gardening, a little bit of cooking, and growing your own food. Now sit back and enjoy. Hey folks, I'm Greg. I'm Sheila. Thank you for joining us. You know what? Here we are in the middle of July. Middle of July, and we're in that low period where the garden here. You know, what do we do? I've been talking to a lot of people the last week. What's going on in the garden? I said, well, we know we're finishing up on everything. Tomatoes are just about gone. Peppers are just about gone. No, no, but some well, of the Well, some holding on, but they're struggling out a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, of course, corn is gone. Winter squash is gone. we got got uh, sweet okra. potatoes growing. Okra, i got another crop of those coming along. For the most part, our spring crops are gone. So, mm. so what do we do? What do you do we in this situation? We can't plant fall yet. Can't plant fall yet, so they got we got a month, six weeks in there. If we're gonna put it back in a fall garden, now I normally don't grow as much fall as I do in the spring. So even though I had spring crops out there, I may not use all that for my fall crops. So I may need something to fill in that right there. That I hate to use this word that I'm gonna use, void. void. That void. Mm -hmm. You and I was at a, uh, a farm in Newberry, Florida earlier this week, and the guy told me something I thought was very, very profound. He says, they are no voids in nature. We were talking about cover crops, and this guy's got 40 acres, and he does a lot of cover crops and things like that, and he said, they are no voids in nature. I found that interesting because what that means is if you don't put something back there, nature will put something back there. And we kind of want to control that process a little bit. So it's so important that we fill those boards with things we want to fill with instead of pigweed or other things that, that's going to cause us problems. So that's what we're talking about today, folks. It's going to be a great show. But... First, we're going to have you taste some peppers. Mm. Now, all these peppers are in a garden that's really in the really, 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 really maturing stage. Yeah. Yeah. I want y'all to look at that hosinator bell pepper there. It's turning. Isn't it pretty? Nice big pale pepper. Hosinator bells did extremely well extremely this year. Extremely well. And we have the poblano, hosinator poblano, gold rush banana, which are turning. Mm hmm. And the Halsinator jalapeno. Mm -hmm. And this is? Aruba Cubanel. Cubanel, yep. Mm -hmm. So the peppers are coming in. We've made some things oh, that, out of them. That might be the red Marconi, Marconi that hadn't turned yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to leave that up to you because I didn't harvest them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. We're going to do a little taste test. Yeah. So what we got here? Okay, so first try orangey sweet. Orangey sweet, and, and we're assuming that's a sweet pepper. I, I don't. I won't be real careful here because she knows I do not do hot very yeah. well. That is sweet. Mm. Very good. Nice pepper. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know why we don't roast more of those or, or grill more of those. Mm -hmm. I've only got one plant of them. I don't know why I planted a lot last year. Mm. I really like it. Okay. So it has a citrusy flavor to it, sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. That's yes to yellow. Yes to yellow. Which is another sweet pepper. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell much difference in that in the orangey sweet. Mm -hmm. And then there's a right on red. There's like three in that little. I, oh, think, I think people would be really amazed how sweet those are. Mm -hmm. For a pepper. Okay. So that's the banana pepper, that's this. This turning, you know, it's normally, this is our gold, gold rush, which is our standard uh, banana pepper that we love. And it's turning a, a orange color on us. They do that as they mature out. Mm, -hmm. mm I like that flavor. But it is not quite as citrusy as this is. Mm-mm, totally different. So now try, I took some of that and I fermented it before it turned. <laughs> I need a cracker to go along with that. 
and our famous poblano. Mm -hmm. Now we love these right here stuff. This is probably my favorite pepper stuff. Stuff. Mm -hmm. Poblano has just a little bit of heat to it, but not a lot. It's not overpowering by no means. Mm -hmm. And we have the famous bell pepper. Mm -hmm. Look how thick the walls are on that bell pepper right there. They do good for stuffing. There's something about a bell. I'm not crazy about the flavor on the bell pepper. That was really mild. Then we have the two that we have left here is a fermented jalapeno and a raw jalapeno. Mm -hmm. Now you did take the seeds out of these. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. It's not very hot either. And then we have the uh, fermented. Now oh, that was good. That's really good. Hmm, I'm glad you didn't get me with no hot, hot no, peppers today. You would expect them bad. Yeah, bad. Yeah, you tried that one right there. It's not hot? Oh, it's right on this end. <laughs> There's a couple seeds there I was wanting to get. Um. You know, if you've never uh, fermented peppers, that's very... Uh, I like the jalapenos better than the banana. They were in the same fermentation. I actually did them with my pickles. Yep, they did turn out well. We had it with fish the other night, and it was really mm -hmm. good to have those peppers in there with our, with our pickles. Great summer snack. Great summer snack, healthy for you. Speaking of healthy, uh, can you tell I've lost any weight? You've been on a diet for five hours? Started this morning on my diet. I was gonna see if y'all <laughs> seen I've lost any weight so far. Have so, you yet? I'm not weighed yet. I've been <laughs> scared to weigh any, but it's come to a point where I got to do a little something. You know what I mean? It always comes to a point where you realize you need to do something. I'm at that point where mm -hmm. I realize I need to do something to, to trim back down just a little bit. Get back to my fighting weight. So we're talking about pollinators and folks, I've had a little revelation in the last few weeks on this subject right here. It's been, uh, it's been a little, I got my glasses on cause it's going to get kind of deep. deep today. But first of all, I want to share everybody a story that I've not been able to share. Because this took me a while to get it. This was a little bit of a, 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 a tragic thing for me and I had some scarring of it and I've not been able to really been able to talk about it up to this point, but I'm going to talk about it today. Uh, people here know about it, but we've not shared it out there. But probably about four weeks ago, I have honeybees here and I've had honeybees. You okay? <laughs> I actually have some footage I could insert here. So we uh, <clears throat> we have honeybees here, and I actually have them right outside the shop door there. Never had any problems much, but the bees I got this year from my buddy Wayne over were a little bit on the what we call aggressive side, which actually is pretty good because when your bees are more aggressive, they seem to be a little hardier and, and able to take care of their self or defend their self better but they've been a little on the mean side. We've had some problems with people getting stung here, uh, just walking back and forth. I've got stung a few times. I got stung You got stung twice. on the eye. They've swarmed oh, three or four times and uh, they've really caused some issues around here. So one of them was what we call bearding up on the hive. So the outside the hive at nighttime, it was really gathering up, which is a sign that you need to do something. So I knew I had this hive that I need to step up to a bigger hive. So in my infinite wisdom, I said, I'm gonna get up in the morning at daylight before anybody comes in because we have people that come in early around here and I didn't want them to be exposed. So I'm gonna get up at daylight in the morning. I'm gonna put my bee suit on and I'm gonna get out there and work these bees and move them up. So I did, I got up early in the morning, got outside, put my bee suit on. It was still a little darkish. I put my dog in the office where Maggie Jane wouldn't get bit out there. And I go out there and I didn't get my smoker or anything because you know, we're gonna do this thing quick. I'm gonna move them up. So I'm out there and I'm moving my bees around and they're mad. They swarming, I mean, they swarming and they are fierce. Lo and behold to me, I feel something on my neck. Now mind you, I got a full bee suit on because I learned years ago, I used to go out there and deal with them without a suit on. And I learned that if I'm gonna continue to do this, I'm gonna put my suit on every time. So I had my suit, complete suit on, not just a veil. One of them bit me on my neck and it dawned on me. He said, how did that happen? I got my bee suit on. 
And that's when I glanced down and I realized there was bees inside my veil and lots of them. There's a little very Velcro piece right there on your suit right here that you have to kind of flip over and catch that Velcro there or it leaves a hole, a gapping hole in there. I had this happen a few years ago, oh, probably 10 years ago, and I hadn't had it happen since. But folks, let me tell you what happened to me. Them bees was inside my veil. Lots of them. So what you do in this situation is you don't panic. What I did in this situation was panic. <laughs> They got to gnawing on me and I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to, I got, I got a little carried away. So uh, I realized at that point I had to get away from them as far as I could. And I had to get that suit off because them bees was enclosed in that veil with me. And, and I'm putting this mildly, they was gnawing on me. I'm talking about lots of them were gnawing on me. So I'm running out and at the same time I'm taking this bee suit off. Well, they are following me. Of course, what ones are not inside my veil here are following me out there. And I've got my veil off and I'm swatting and carrying them on. And I don't know why, but I decided I need to run toward the road. I guess in my mind, I was going to run down the road or I knew I had to get rid of them. Well, here's where it really gets bad. So I get out there about halfway or three quarters away of where I was planning on going. I'm out there close to the road and it's at daylight in the morning. And I got that suit down past my knees. And if you know what these suits are, they got these things down at the bottom and they fit fairly tight on you. So at that point, I'm, I'm ganged up down there and the suit's all wadded around my feet and I can't move. I'm a stepping about this far in between steps and this thing is just wadded up around my feet down there. I can't move. I'm a swatting them bees on my he head up here and they're eating on me. And I'm in a terrible situation. Lo and behold, the guy that's our warehouse manager, he gets here early every morning and he pulls in about the time that he sees me having this fit out here in the driveway. Well, I can just imagine in his mind, he didn't know what was going on, he, but he knew it was bad. So he pulls up there, he didn't get out of his truck, he hollers at me and I jumped on his tailgate and he took off down the road. <laughs> and that's the only way to get them bees off me. It hadn't been for Dalton coming in when he did. I guess I'd still be out there swatting them bees tied up in that suit down at the bottom because I couldn't walk. How many times you get bit? I got bit a lot. I mean a lot. You had a bad day though. I had a bad day and they wanted me to go to the hospital. I said, no, I'm not going to the hospital, daughter. I said, I can, I can fend this off. I've gotten bit a lot before. But I, I, I did about two o'clock that afternoon. I never did go to the doctor, but I did get to feeling bad that afternoon. But uh, boy, I'm mm -hmm. telling you, they worked on my poor head was swollen up all over. They worked on me. Now I tell you all this, perp this story for a purpose. At that moment, I made a decision <laughs> that I was not gonna be a honeybee man anymore <laughs> after that right there. That was gonna wind my beekeeping up. Uh, I said I told them bees what they could do and what they could do without there, and I and might where they could go. and where they could go, and a few ugly words probably to there, and I meant what I said. I'm pretty much am through with honeybees, and I've had honeybees for a long time. Now, after I got recuperated from this right here, still those honeybees are still out there. They can die. They can do whatever they want to. do. I'm not messing with them anymore. But they're still there. I'm gonna leave them alone. But I got to really paying attention in my garden, some of the flowers that was blooming. I really got, every morning when I go out there, I got to noticing about my bees and my pollinators. And I noted this year that I had more wild bees than I've ever had before. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that my honeybees maybe was not doing the amount of work that I thought they was doing all along. Now, I don't remember, ever remember having as many wild bees as I got this year. And I don't ever remember having as many bumblebees as I had this year. Is it coincidence? I don't know. Have I made an effort to have pollinator friendly plants in my garden? Yes. Did I do all this intentionally? I don't know. But I do know the fact that I had lots of wild bees, I had lots of bumblebees, and it, it appeared to me that the honeybees wouldn't do as much as to pollinate as maybe as I had thought before. Maybe this is something I'm just wanting to think, mm -hmm. but it's something that I paid attention to. So I have a new strategy in the garden. And I'd like to share it with you all, so maybe you can, you could also embrace some of the strategy. I am going to focus on 
beneficial pollinators. And I'm gonna do that with several different ways, but one of the ways I'm gonna do it is with cover crops. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. How can you implement cover crops and also be friendly to the pollinators in your garden? And, uh, you know, a lot of you guys out there have your own honeybee hives, and that's wonderful that you do. But there's a lot of people out there that's never gonna be able to have honeybees in hives on your property to pollinate your garden. But there's a lot more pollinators than just honeybees. Exactly. You got birds. You got butterflies. Yeah. You got regular flies. Yes, I guess so. Bats. Bats. But bees do the majority of our vegetable pollination. So that's one thing I'm really concentrating is on is how can we increase our population of these pollinators and how can we be more friendly toward them to encourage more of that so we don't have to deal with these dude gum honeybees. Do you know that <laughs> one third of the human food comes from plants I pollinated do. by pollinators? They, it's a huge importance to our ecosystem. Yeah. It is. Do you know there's over 3,600 wild bee species found in the United States? I had no idea. Over 3,600 species, or roughly over 3,600 wow. species of wild bees. So I think in the past we have, and I know I have, we have underestimated our wild bee or our native bee mm -hmm. populations. So what can you do? All right, so we're in that void now that we don't have anything growing. Now, I've got some flowers in my garden. you got some flowers yeah, in your garden. Yeah, and I'm going to throw up some pictures here. In the raised bed garden, I use sunflowers as my cover crops. Mm -hmm. And I was out there looking this morning, and they were three different types of bees and some flies on those sunflowers. Yep. All right, first of all, let's, 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 let's go into cover crops and then to kind of move it into the, the pollinator thing. So we're going to throw this graph up to you right now, and we're going to show you what some of these cover crops, what their benefits are, and we'll go over that real quick. All right, as you see there on the graph right there, you see nitrogen source. Now, when we say nitrogen, we're talking about legumes, the ones that actually pull that nitrogen in from the atmosphere and harness that nitrogen that we can use for our crops. And that would be, excuse me, the clovers, cow peas, sun hemp, vetch, any peas. All right, now let's move on to the next one here, which is nitrogen scavenger, which is different from a legume. Now, now legumes bring in our nitrogen and attach it to the root system. Mm -hmm. there. When we turn these crops in, these legumes in, when they start decaying, they release that nitrogen. Now, nitrogen scavengers are the ones that, like we plant corn or anything like that, and the season's up with, and we got that nitrogen in the soil, but it's fixing to leave out. These are the crops that we plant in there that bring it back up to the top to the nutrient cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the best ways I like to use these nitrogen scavengers is behind corn because it takes so much nitrogen for corn. And that would be flacilla, super leaf flacilla, canola, and sunflower. So that's where that sunflower flacilla comes in as being great for the scavengers to follow those plants, mm -hmm. such as those high nitrogen requirement plants, such as corn. Now, the other side of that, I would like to use a legume before the corn, so the it corn. creates the nitrogen, the corn uses the nitrogen, and then we get to scavenge it and keep it in the nitrogen cycle with super B flacilla and sunflowers. Erosion control. Now this is an important one because we just had a huge storm here about three or four weeks ago and we had some erosion in uh, one of our plots out back there. Uh, crimson clover, white clover, cow peas is good for erosion, especially the red ripper because it has such dense uh, foliage there. All right, let's talk about forage value. Now I know it's not a big one for a lot of you out there for backyard gardeners, but some of you guys do have, uh, you know, you, you like to forage your, your cover crops here. And we got the clovers, we got the forage radishes here that we call daikon radish there. Weed management, now this is a big one right here. I have a big problem with pigweed because I've just been guarding my plot for so long. Buckwheat, we've talked about buckwheat a lot. Buckwheat is probably the best summertime cover crop for weed management because it grows so quick that it will uh, shade the rest of those weeds out. Cow peas, red ripper, same thing, it's a good one. Sun hemp and sunflower as well. Probably not as good. I've had at least two of the best ones, I'd say. Red ripper pea 
in book week. Book week. Nematode management. Here we go, folks. A lot of y'all got nematodes out there. We got canola you can use, or you can use the mustards or some of the brassicas there for cover crop for nematode management. I, my favorite is the Kodiak brown mustard there. Mm -hmm. And then compaction. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use some of the mustards, brassicas. I think if you got a compaction problem, you could be using daikon radish. So all these you're listing are cover crops but they're used now these are used during different times of year we're going to zoom in on okay. warm season so you're deciding do you want to attract honeybees do you want weed control do you want um erosion or do you need something to yep. get down and penetrate that soil? all right because we're in that void now where we got to put something out there and we got to decide which one we're going to use okay let's just say that you got an erosion problem your primary focus is to plant something out there for erosion control. Brown top millet is probably the top one on that right there. Now brown top millet is not going to do anything for pollinators, but it's going to do pretty good for erosion control. So let's talk about the ones that you can use that are good summertime cover crops that are also good for pollinators. And this is what was very interesting to me. Get down here to my notes. Now I actually found this report it's from the SARE.org. Sarah. Sarah. If you're not familiar with SARE, then uh, you can go online. It's a lot of government grants have been given to people to do particular researches. And a lot of them are really good. A lot of them are done with uh, for organic growing in mind or, you know. And this article is cover cropping for pollinators and beneficial insects. Yep. So we can put this link up yeah. on the screen there where you can go to it and find out what we're talking about here. It's a pretty lengthy read, but it's good. And it tends to lead to the side of farming more, but we can also take all this and use it in our small backyard vegetable garden. All right, so I just mentioned millet. Millet's a good one there. We use it, we use it all the time. For It's good forager. It is good for erosion control, but on this right here, it lists every one of them, at least their honeybee value, their wild bee value, and their beneficial insect value. Let's talk about millet. Millet has no honeybee value. Mm -hmm. Millet has no wild bee value and has low beneficial insect value. So from that standpoint, we don't want to plant millet out there unless we've got a specific issue for it. Either we're going to graze it or we're going to use it for erosion control. It does do pretty good for biomass, moving biomass into the soil. All right, let's move to another one that I've touted a lot, and this is sorghum sand grass. Same thing, it's good for erosion control. It is good for long-term uh, cover crop because you can mow it and it'll come back. But it has, and this is what's discouraging to me, has little to no value for wild bees or for honeybee production. And on the beneficial insect value, moderate. So there again, we don't use sorghum sedan grass if we're really concerned about those pollinators. Now this is the one that was really amazing to me. I had no idea, cow peas. We talk about cow peas, we're talking about red ripper, we're talking about iron clay peas, or you could use any of the rest of them. But we value those two most of the time as a cover crop. Did you know those are very high? for wild bees and listed high as honeybees. No, I don't know that. Yeah, the nectar flow from a cow pea is very high. I've just never really paid attention to that. Hmm. And it's also very high for your uh, beneficial insect. So if you're looking for one right there, cow peas is a good one. Cow peas, the bloom cycle on cow peas is not gonna be that long, but it's gonna do great. And we know you can also take these red ripper peas and eat those as well. So or you could have them to the animals. Or feed them to the animals right there. Next one, sun hemp. Sun hemp's one that we like. Uh, grows big, has those big fiber stalks to it. And I don't recommend it a lot if you don't have a tractor to get rid of it because it can have that real tough stalk to it. Sun hemp has moderate um, rating on honeybee flow, but it has a very high rating for wild bees and a moderate rating for beneficial insects there. You know, I've noticed the sun hemp, the insects do love them. I thought it would have rated higher on the honeybee than moderate. 
That's interesting there. All right, here we move to Mr. Buckwheat. I got buckwheat planted out in the garden now. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really get a good stand off my buckwheat, and I figured out why the other day. Why? The rabbits have been eating it off. Ah, those rabbits. Yep. Right when it comes up, they've been eating it off. I thought, surely I should have a better stand than what I did. But anyway, buckwheat is an annual that grows off real quick, and it has got rated a very high honeybee rating and a very high wild bee rating and it has a high beneficial insect value uh it's one of the three that we're going to talk about that has high 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 mm -hmm. did you know that when you planted it i knew i knew they loved it but one of the problems that i've said before and i, I may have i don't know that i may be wrong about this right here because i've always said with buckwheat you want to extinguish it when it blooms because if it seeds out, it can be come back and be a weed. But you know, I've never had it come back to be a weed. And if we're going to go in this thing with this idea that we're going to grow these things as a cover crop for several different reasons, such as weed management or biomass and its pollinators, we're going to need to change the way we have thought about buckwheat in the past and maybe not extinguish it at well, bloom set. So you let it finish out blooming. And if you do have to, at that point, you want to mow just part of it and not all of it, and not mow it all at one time. But I think what I'm going to do is let it go completely through with this bloom cycle before I get rid of it. Because what am I feeding? The bees. The bees. Next one is Facilia. We love Super B Facilia. The problem with Super B Facilia is it doesn't do really good during July and August. So at the end of August, we're going to plant more of this. We're going to grow it in for the fall and the winter time and probably plant some more next spring. Wonderful, wonderful for the bees. It's very high on honeybee production, very high on wild bees and high on beneficial insects. You found that out this spring. I found that, that I did. But what really amazed me was the bumblebees. Mm -hmm. The bumblebees just eat it up and loved it. And then we got sunflowers, which I think is probably one of the top ones right there. Sunflowers, being a nitrogen scavenger, also rates high on scale for honey flow or honeybees, wild bees, and beneficial insects. So we got that one right there. And, you know, they're fairly easy to get rid of, and everybody loves mm -hmm. sunflowers. Pretty. So the three... And they're good to detoxify your soil. They are. They are. So we have three here that are on the high, that being buckwheat, flacelia, and sunflower. And we know we can't plant flacelia right now, so we got peas that we could plant. This may be not on the highest, but yet we get the, we get a food source off of those if we plant the uh, the red ripper there. So we got those you can plant, buckwheat, sunflower, and then flacelia just a little bit later on. That's some of the things I'm going to be doing in my garden during this, this lull period here and getting into it. Now, what about people in raised beds? What do they do? Uh, the mustard. Are you talking about for pollinators? Mm -hmm. For this lull period here that you have that you're going in to fall, we have a good many. Now, we have some dwarf zinnias that work fine. Yeah. There. But we got a whole host of dwarf sunflowers. Mm -hmm. And we have found ones. those have been perfect for you guys to do raised beds out there for a cover crop slash pollinator friendly there. In, in one of my beds, I actually planted regular sunflowers in the middle and then the dwarfs around it. Hmm, that yeah. was a good idea. Yeah. Now some of, the, some of the ones you may want to use this right here and I'm gonna list off some of the dwarf sunflowers is sun gold dwarf and i've got all these i think growing in my garden as of right now sun gold dwarf sun spot dwarf which is a little difference in the two then you got lemon cutie and oh, lemon I love pixel the lemon cutie. yep and then we got the dwarf zinnias you can use as well you could use a, a regular size zinnia but if you don't want them to get too far out of control you probably won't go with that dwarf zinnia right there you know what else they like is the basil if you let it bloom out mm-hmm Yep, basil's a good one. Most people grow that in their kitchen garden as well. Mm -hmm. So there are some other things that, let's just say that you got an area that's close to your garden, and we've got one we're working on now. Uh, that we're going to turn into more of a native 
B Bank. How about B Bank? Have you worked at work before? B Bank. B -bank. And we're going to use this right here. We got an area that we got down in our next to our garden. It's a native area, you might want to say. It's an area we really don't use. It's got pines in it, but we've cleaned it up and we're kind of. We've got wildflowers. We got what? We're, we're re taking control of that mm -hmm. area, I guess is the best way to put it. We're managing. Manage that area. But we're putting in. We've got wildflowers been there for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some yarrow I planted down there, and I've also, I'm experimenting with some butterfly weed down there. Have you planted it yet? I've planted some in the greenhouse. Uh -huh. Got some in the greenhouse. I'm gonna plant some down there in the next day or two. Yeah, I got some milkweed down there, which is mm -hmm. good for the yep. pollinators. So using an area like that with perennials is what we classify as a bee bank. That's going to be something that you really don't have to tend to a lot. It's like a native area. Yeah, but you're going to have them going to it all the time down there. And uh, adds a good bit of splash color as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we got some things there you can use for that. We have the bee feed wildflower mix you can use for that. We have the beneficial insect mix you can put in there. It has some annuals and perennials in there. And we're experimenting with some of these. I'm excited about some of these individual perennials that we're testing out this year. See how it goes. If they work out well, we may offer them to y'all next year. They are no voids in nature. Remember that. That's profound there. Profound. Very good. Thank you. I actually learned something today. What'd you learn? About the cow peas? Yeah, the cow peas. I thought that was interesting. And the buckwheat. But you don't need, if you get rid of the buckwheat too If you quick, get rid of it too quickly, you, you, like we have done in the past, then you've defeated your purpose. Mm -hmm. So hang in there and let it bloom. Now the problem with buckwheat is it didn't last that long, which is a good thing if yeah. we're going to flip it over and use in it fall. for a fall crop, which is ideal actually. Me and my glasses. And I can't see with them or without them. Without them. Good information there. All right. Garden Spotlight. This is from John Mullis, Oak Harbor. Oh my goodness, John's got it going Washington. on. Washington? Yep. Zone 8. It's kind of hard to believe Washington. <sighs> no, but we, uh, we know somebody else is yeah. in Zone 8 in Washington. Um, so he's got carrots, potatoes, onions, broccoli, flowers. He's got a mixture of all Yeah, it looks like he's got some raised beds going mm -hmm. on there in containers, yep. And there again, just shows you what you can accomplish in just a small area there. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's in a small backyard area. Yep. Got it going on, John. Thank you for Thank sending you that John. in. Old goat drawing. Yeah. Yeah, I put the old goat out this way. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> the old goat's on the set somewhere. If, if you find the old goat, put it in the comments below. And next week we'll do a drawing, and whoever wins gets a nice gift sent to them. This week's, no, excuse me, this week's winner for last week is Paul Case. Paul sent us your shipping info, uh, info to custserve at hostools.com, and we will get you something nice sent out. Right. And then last week we talked about our top four gardener reasons. You know that was a good show last week, wasn't it? It was good. Um, love reading all the comments. And most of them, I say the majority of them, they garden because it's in their blood. It's just in their blood. And I mean, think about that, but that's... I can concur, concur I can with concur. that. concur. If it's yeah. in your blood, you pretty much, yeah. you may not like it when you're younger, but like a child, but yeah. it's in the Or a blood. teenager yeah, that's or mad teenager. at the world. So I drew from all those comments and Tambra, T-A-M-B-R-A Smith won that prize. And it's a pollinator garden. There you go. How about that? Yeah, so Tambra sent us your, uh, or do we have her address? Yeah. We got your address? I think so. I think I saw her. Okay. But she can send it. Send us your information there, Tambra, and uh, your ship information. We'll get this nice pollinator garden collection out to you. Huh. It's all about pollinators. Ain't all it? about pollinators. It's all about pollinators. And then um, Petals from the Past. Mm -hmm. YouTuber meet and greet event, September the 9th. 
You can go on their website. There's no cost for it, but they do want kind of an estimate of how many people is going to come. Well, how do they know this? You send this in to somebody? Or? Yeah, on Pedals from the Past, there's a little place oh, okay. to register. Okay. Um, I'll see if I can get that link. They're going to have food trucks there to Food trucks. Yeah. Um, the nursery is there. And I think 35 meet and greet yep. YouTubers. Yep. It's on a Saturday, 9 to 5. Yep. All right. All right, folks, this is what uh, this is what's going to be your homework assignment for this week. Every time that you go out to the garden, and I go out to my garden early in the morning, I'm assuming a lot of you guys do too. When you go out to your garden, just take a few moments just to stand there and look around and look at the pollinators in your garden to assess how many pollinators you got and what kind they are. And just take a moment to enjoy them and the and appreciate what all they do. I think you'll learn some things. I really caught myself learning about them in there, learning what all, you know, I just sometimes I just look down at them. These native bees, think how they're pollen right in here in a different area there. They yeah. cut around. One of those I saw this morning on my sunflowers, they were covered in pollen. It was hard to tell what it was. They were yep. so yep. covered in pollen. All right. Pay attention, love the pollinators, be friendly to them. Thank you for joining us. Now it's time for you to get out there and get dirty.